previously on Corkout History. On our last episode, we moved from Zaida to Henry and Raymond, the cousins who married Theresa and Uraka, Afonso VI's children, and how that led into the independence of a small county called Condado Portucalense, and how these two guys forged a pact to avoid any other attempts of getting these lands merged together. We also went down the rabbit hole of Uraka, the death of Raymond, and Uraka's new husband, Afonso I of Navarra, and the little civil war that came after that. Oh, and we also talked about Henry and Teresa, or as Inez likes to put it, this power couple who weren't taking no shit. Yes, we are getting closer to Portugal. Welcome to another episode of Corkout History. And so here we are. Henry of Burgundy and Teresa, who was meant to be a beauty, are married in 1094. She was possibly a minor, and he must have been around 25. We think that probably around the, the year 1109, although there are no clear records of the exact year, their only male heir, Dom Afonso Henriques, was born. Possibly in Guimarães, Viseu, or the city of Coimbra. Now, this is a very, very fucking important name. Everyone keep it in their minds. Dom Afonso Henriques. Henriques means that he is son of Henrique, so basically Henry, son of Henry. The S, so Henriques, son of Henrique, the S is to signify possession, and this is a leftover from the Latin declination and Roman influence. Uh, pretty much, actually, as we have in English at the moment. The apostrophe S signifying possession. As it was typical of these times, Dom Afonso Henrique, so this son, is given to a Portuguese nobleman to be raised. And he was raised in the household of Egas Muniz. According to some authors, it is possible that this would have been Hermígio Muniz, his brother instead, since he was the one to have an important and influent role later on. But honestly, let's stick to Egas Muniz here. Now, there is some interesting things going on with Agus Muniz, and could he have played us all? <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the where we dive into the real, uh, into the realm of legend a little bit, isn't it? So, shall I tell you about the legend? Yeah, do tell us about the legend. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, according to some. Don Alfonso was supposed to have been born with very weak legs, so there was something wrong with his uh, poor little legs. Unfit legs, as the, some of the sources mention. Now, the amazing thing is that, you know, he was born this way, and then he is given to uh, Egas Moniz, or possibly his brother, and he goes and he is raised in their household and everything, and so... I don't know, 10 years later or a few years later, there he comes and he's this perfectly fit boy and with perfectly working legs, which is, you know, kind of a bit amazing. Now, this Egas Muniz explained this away, saying that he took the child to this holy place and he prayed a little bit somewhere in the middle of the mountains and that the Virgin Mary herself... Um, decided to take care of this and gave the, the little kid like perfectly working legs. Now, this is great. However, of course, this could not stop the evil tongues around town who straight away said that maybe Egas Munich had actually swapped the kids and given, put his own son in place of uh, Don Alfonso Henrique. So, was he actually exchanged by the son of Egas Munich? Honestly, he was probably most likely the son of Henry and Teresa, and this is just, you know, some crazy rumors around town, but hey, it's fun to think about, right? This is actually quite interesting, because it shows that Portugal and the first king of Portugal would have divine... Yeah, would have divine protection. From the very early stages, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of a narrative that starts to be uh, built straight from the beginning of his life because we're going to see that eventually throughout his uh, ascendancy to 
uh, such an important role in the foundation of Portugal, there will be other miracles involved. So, of course, this might be part of that construction of someone that right from the beginning has divine protection and divine favor. And it legitimizes the king and the country in the eyes of the people. As we mentioned in the previous episode, Henry and Teresa, they really went to town giving their sister a hard time. They were playing both fields. They would both play with Uraka. They would both play against her. They were always playing the game to get the best deals for, for themselves. Now, Do Henrique, he, he dies in 1112 during the siege of Astorga. Uh, while he was actually still playing the game. And this leaves Dona Teresa as regent of the county. Astorga was under siege by the king of Aragon, so Afonso I, Uhaka's husband, who was in, in war with her. Henry and Uhaka managed to hold the city, but Henry would nonetheless die from the injuries with hope during the fight. So here we go, to the very end he's playing the game and that's how he goes. Now, things turn a bit sour between the two sisters, with Dona Teresa striving for independence. In 1116, the city of Coimbra is attacked by the Moors, once again, and Dona Teresa, as head of the county, regent of the country, drops everything and goes to Coimbra herself, where she leads the defense of the city. She's fucking brilliant and she nails this so hard that when she declares herself queen the pope himself recognizes her and this would be pope pascal in 1116 so can we just so what is going on here is that whereas we always say that don Fonse Henrique is the first king of portugal actually the sources state dona teresa has the first queen has the first monarch of the country. Okay, this is fucking awesome. Uh, there's a document from eleven. Uh, there's a document from eleven seventeen where she's clearly referred to as Queen of po Portugal, making her the first Portuguese monarch. It's fucking awesome. Granted, she's later captured by her sister and forced to bend the knee, but she still gets to keep the title. I know it's not great, but, well, it's what we get. Yes, so this is, like, a huge thing. Like, we're talking about someone that's called the queen of this particular piece of land, making it a separate thing, a separate entity, a kingdom in itself, and this is huge. And because of a lot of things that we're going to get into about Dona Teresa and what happens next we tend to oversee this bit where she is actually the first monarch of this country. Kingdom. Kingdom. Exactly. And I have to say that I know, uh, maybe people don't know, but I know exactly how things are going to turn and how the popular opinion is going to turn for Dona Teresa. However, like during this time, she was actually pretty popular within the county because she was, you know, the... Um, the flag of independence, she was striving for it, she was a, an extremely clever woman. And she was actually going south and conquering things and then like and protecting the, the, the boundaries and extending, expanding them. Was she expanding them? I don't know. No, but she was keeping the, the borders of the kingdom, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and the people of Coimbra were uh, super grateful to her for this because basically her leadership at the time was outstanding. And I mean, the 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 country, uh, the country and the county itself. Like, it w Dona Teresa was super popular. She was uh, a standard. She was a beacon for the for the resistance against the. Um, she was a beacon for the resistance against Castilla and Leon, and she was uh, fighting for independence. And she was extremely popular with the people. Yeah, it's it's re it's really it's really curious what we're just about to see. Because how what's gonna happen next is what we keep more in memory and what we talk about more often when thinking of this figure. Yeah, because history is written by the winners, as we know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And especially the yeah. Yeah, the male winners. <laughs> 
Now a widow, Dona Teresa gets romantically involved with a Galician nobleman called Bermudo Pérez de Trava. So this is the same family that we've talked before and that we said that would be important in shaping all this. And although documentation is not very clear, they seem to have been living together, which is judged to be relatively normal, it seems. Yeah, because, I mean, it's not something that we think would be accept acceptable at a time. We always think that the times were more conservative in the past and the, uh, the power of the church was so much more overwhelming and stuff like that. But actually, well, I mean... Things just happen. It's still life, you know? And apparently this was a lot more common than we could anticipate from our modern standing. Yeah, yeah. This is still life. These are people, they're alive, and shit is messy. Which is something we also tend to forget when we're talking about, like, things in the past. But, like, things happen, you know? Uh, life does happen. Yeah. 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 People die, you get with other people, people fuck even if everyone's alive. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, just life. However, when later on she starts a relationship with the brother of this Bermudo guy, who's called Fernão Pérez de Trava, this seemed to get the public opinion on fire. You think? I mean, she was with one brother and then she goes on to the other brother? Yeah, I think even today the tabloids would have a field day with that. And it's here that we see the switch from what we were saying before as of Dona Teresa as um, a, 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 a good figure in the public eye to something else that's more of what we have in our collective memory in Portugal. Apparently, on that day and age, a woman dating two men of the same family was somehow considered incest. Of course, it didn't help that her new liaison was seen as more ambitious by the Portuguese nobility, which believed him to be a danger to the independence of the realm and feared the extent of his control over the county. Yeah, so basically the lords of the county weren't happy about this. Just this Galician nobleman having way too much power and way too much influence over their lady. Not a fan. And get ready because it only gets worse when her first Trava, so the first Trava brother with who she was, decides to marry her daughter instead. Now, the optics weren't great. Not only had Donna Teresa been with both brothers, but also the first brother had been with the mother and the daughter both. You could hardly get more medieval incestuous than that if you tried. Uh, please don't. Please don't try. Right, so we cannot know whether it was love or politics or hopefully both. It is said that Donna Teresa had always wanted to be queen and an equal to her sister Uraka in rank. The play seemed to be to unite Dona Teresa and the Trava family, and with that strive for a united and independent Portugale and Galicia. From the Cantabric Sea to the Mondego River, the old kingdom of the Suevi. Now that's a whole, like, plan, isn't it? Like a whole idea of from Cantabric Sea to the Mondego River, like, look at that. It is. It is. And it's exactly like a throwback in time to uh, to the Suevi kingdom that we had before. Before all the Visigoth people came and conquered. I've, se I've seen some people argue that the, some idea of na national identity started, or proto-national identity, started from that kingdom. With this in mind, Dona Teresa battles her sister in 1116. And, and then again, four years later, in 1120. As we said before, she then gets captured and is forced to bend the knee. So that puts a stop to this, um, to this expansionist project. So from 1121, Fernão Pérez de Trava, Dona Teresa's 
lover, settles living in the county, living and governing Portugale, which was extremely unpopular with the Portuguese nobility, he and started to raise resistance and make them turn to Dom Afonso Henriques, the son of Dona Teresa, as an alternative. Yeah, so so yeah, so I think this is the right point for us. Just before we move on into Dom Afonso Henriques and the this faction that supports him to stop and think a bit about Dona Teresa as we said before because the way we look at her today and the way that we look at her in Portugal has always been more of what comes after this and this this um, resistance to her relationship and the influence of the Galician Fernão Pérez Trava than anything else. Yeah, she's painted as a fucking demon, is she not? She's painting as a fucking demon, and is it a coincidence that the demon is a clever and ambitious woman who stands her ground? Is it really? If this was a man doing exactly the same thing, sleeping with one sister and the other, and just fighting for the kingdom and the independence, and whoa, we got a hero here, but as it was a woman, we subject her to this this idea of, okay, she was going to be... Um, just under the influence of her lover she yeah we just and we believe that she's this this spawn of the devil who just goes around spreading her legs and having ideas in her head and wanting to make more of herself and be a queen how dare she we even allow that that in our history there's this we will get there eventually the this tale of a son that beats his mother in order to get the independence of his kingdom and that's okay because she's bad you know and of course we know that's not true and we're gonna get that eventually but um you know it's it's really yeah yeah it's acceptable that she would be subject to the humiliation and violence because well because she's She's nasty, isn't she? Oh, nasty women having ideas and ambition. Ah, pish. So of course, there's, there's, there's. Regardless of how she's painted after, there's also what actually happens at the moment, which is factions of Portuguese or of Portugal's nobility that are worried with their power in relation to. The Galician influence, that's that's a fact, like that's that's for real and that has to be taken into consideration because let's not forget that that Portugal's nobility is going to get um, around this kid because at the time Afonso Henriques is still a kid but he is the key for them not to lose any grounds when it comes to lands and power and etc. So there's also that. So it's a double thing of like what happened then and how it was painted after in relation to her, but also in relation to the established powers in that place. Yeah, and it's like at that time, uh, Don Alfonso was still a king. Uh, Don Alfonso Henrique was still a kid. But, uh, you know, this all, this doesn't happen overnight. And things takes time and honestly it doesn't take that much for a kid to grow. So by the time that the tension reaches the high point, he's actually around 1819, which is a grown-ass man uh, by that time standards. That being said, this power game was not only played between um, factions of nobility and factions of political power in these territories, but they were also played in the realm of religious um the huge importance of Santiago de Compostela which is a town up in modern Galicia starts during the 19th century and a big rivalry between that town and Braga will be brought forward so the rivalry between the two cities grows to another extent with a very curious episode which was which will lead us on to a little mini rabbit hole isn't it Inês? well i wouldn't i wouldn't call it as much a rabbit hole but i just want to say that it's like so the archbishop of santiago goes to steal the relics of braga so not only the relics of braga but more particularly he goes to steal the supposed head of Santiago. So, you know, the relic was the whole head of Santiago, which miraculously, through however ways, was being held in Braga. 
and the Archbishop of Santiago goes there and takes it away. I mean, can we just? <laughs> Isn't this hilarious? I love it. I love this little this little episode. Santiago, by the way, Santiago is St. James. Uh, Santiago is the name in uh, Spain and Portugal. So the head of St. James was being held in Braga and on comes the fucking Archbishop of, of Santiago de Compostela and steals it away. Guys, come on. I even. Obviously, things couldn't stop here and this escalates, the whole thing escalates and the Archbishop will actually be leading an invading army um, and, dis and destroying the construction and destroying and destroying and delaying the construction works of the Cathedral of Bar Braga. The Cathedral of Braga. There we go. I mean, this is some dedication to the cause It's also here. important to bear in mind that Santiago, or so this, this city up in, the, in Galicia, was already like really big in Christianity because St. James, Santiago, was meant to have been the one to introduce the peninsula to Christianism in the flesh. Somehow between the death of Christ in 32 AD and 42 AD, when St. James is killed in the Holy Land, he's, he would have been in the peninsula. And then his body... Huh? <laughs> it's what they say! Okay. After that, his body would eventually return wrapped in stars, hence the name Compostela, to Galicia. Hence the name Compostela to Galicia for some reason, but his head would have stayed behind physically in the Holy Land, where the Bishop of, Bishop of Braga would later find it by chance in the 13th century. Isn't that great? I mean, it's a solid theory if I ever heard one. It's an amazing story and turn of events, and but that talks us more about these two places, one in the Contado Portugalense and one in Galicia, that had a very, very big um, weight in terms of religious pilgrimage, religious importance and religious power. They clash and that's, that will be one extra um, layer of conflicting powers between the two uh, kingdoms. By the time the tension reached its zenith, Don Alphonse Henriques had knighted himself. So this is a thing that only kings could do, because obviously the king should be the one knighting people, and he, by knighting himself, he was stating that he didn't recognize his cousin as his king, because he, as a king, was knighting himself. Um, but what was happening then with his mother? Wasn't he supposed... Is it because of his cousin that he's knighting himself or is it because of his mother? I, I actually don't know. He he has both fronts, actually. So he will go against his mother uh, for to be the head of Portugale. And he also wants to be independent from his cousin. So he's actually fighting in both fronts. And then after knighting himself, he then distinguished himself in the siege of Guimarães. Uh, this siege was laid by his cousin, Afonso VII. In 1127, the siege took place after Afonso VII's mother, Dona Urraca, had died in 1126, and Dom Afonso VII wished to be recognized by the Portuguese as their king. In the siege, Egas Muniz, the one who raised our king, Dom Afonso Henriques, would have to come out to Afonso VII to swear that the king relented the and accepted the sovereignty of Afonso VII in exchange for peace. Afonso VII accepted his surrender and lifted the siege. According to the legend, when later Dom Afonso Henriques breaks the peace by invading Galicia, then Egas Muniz and all his family show up to Afonso VII dressed as condemned criminals and with ropes around their necks, placing their lives in the hands of the Spanish king for the broken word. According to the legend, the king was so impressed with the extent of their, of their honesty that he let them walk free. Now, it's a bit dramatic, but hey, here we go! So in the Portuguese county, Afonso VII was not only battling Don Afonso Henrique, but he was also battling the mother, Dona Teresa. Yeah, and just think how different things could have been if Dona Teresa had actually won 
against Dom Alfonso, Seti- uh, Dom Alfonso VII rather than Dom Alfonso Henriques. One year after that, in 1128, we reach one of the most important moments in Portuguese history. <laughs> so, the 24th of July of 1128 is one of the most important days to the country of Portugal. This is the day of the Batalha of São Mamede, when Dom Afonso Henriques and Dona Tr- and his mother, Dona Teresa, finally come to battle. So it's now that we have the two powers inside of the Portuguese county fighting against each other. So those factions that we were talking before, the people that supported the Galician faction and the Portuguese faction, it's now that they come to battle. And no... Although history tells us that this is where Afonso beats his mother, he does not actually physically beat her. Come on. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I, I mean, seriously, until, until recently, I never realized that people meant this literally. I've always, I always knew that people like actually thought that he slapped his mother, you know, but... But it's not, it's just a matter of factions, and we want to leave that clear that we know that it's just a matter of the people representing both sides. They were the ones battling, not Afonso and Teresa. Like, no. And this is the moment where Afonso Henrique, Don Afonso Henrique, wins over his mother. And this. Yeah, and it's a very. We can't overstate the importance of this moment to the foundation of Portugal. This is the crucial... uh, It's not that Portugal is going to be founded at this moment, but it's just that there are no competing... Competing? There is no... Yeah, but there are no competing... There is no competition for the monarch who will lead the country. So basically the country is not independent yet, but Dom Afonso Henrique is, after this battle, the undisputed leader of the county of Portugal. From this moment onwards, Portugale and Galicia are now definitely separated. From Coimbra, he plans and shows an unrelenting will to expand his land south, while simultaneously laying strong foundations for the law and order of his conciliers. Conselhias is kind of a district organization, not district, but like small districts. That's stuff to translate. Yes, and it just reinsures the importance of cities and and their independence from the nobility. So, uh, at this time, there is the introduction of something that's like cartas de fural. This is basically just the document issued by the king recognizing a town has a town. This can be seen as a pact between the monarch and the people of the town, stipulating their rights and privileges, as well as duties as citizens. Now, this is extremely important, and Don Afonso was, um, was crucial into setting this in motion, because it empowers the people and this pact between the two. So it, remo- it removes the emphasis from the feudal lords, uh, from the nobility, who owned the lands before, And this way, the nobility will not threaten the royal supremacy. So there's a pact direct between the people and the king without the lords in the middle. So there will still be a few centuries before we see the end of feudalism and the relations between the populations and these feudal lords. But we see the king, well, the soon-to-be king, shifting the power from these lords into himself in these very specific areas of the country, in these cities. Exactly, because only the cities would be dependent from the king. All the, ter- all the lands around it, they were still associated with the feudal lords, with the nobility. But the big towns, the big uh, civilian centers, they are directly um, associated with the king and the royal power. And that really shifts the power, in some way, from the nobility to the king. And 
given that we're talking about a rebel king and of a king that's not been formally recognized by the powers sur surrounding him and by the Pope and by Galicia and by Castile, it's really important that he is on this way of solidifying his power with the population. So, this is just battle after battle. This was a very busy man. And in 1139, another extremely important battle for the identity of the country takes place. In 1139, the Battaglia di Oric, so the Battle of Oric, which supposedly takes place place on the 25th of July. Now questions soar about this obscure battle, the Battaglia of Oric, which opposes Don Alfonso Henriques to the Muslim powers. It's it's after this battle that Afonso is starting it will start starts going by the title of King of the Portuguese. Interestingly, a title more related to people than the lands. And if you recall what we just said about this connection with people and um, the cities and the... Which is really curious if you think that this is still a territory that is trying to expand. So by calling himself king of, king of the people instead of the land, he's also allowing for this kind of... And the and not the not the fine land to to be what he's ruling over because he's ruling over a people. Am I going on a like? Am I going crazy here? No, I, I don't think you are. I would say that yeah, it's more about the identity of the Portuguese people more so than associate this to a physical land, because there you go. Because the land is still expanding. Um, and the borders are not set. I, I totally agree with you. So the Battaglia d'Oric the, the Battaglia d'Oric will be seen as a founding moment from the 13th century onwards, um, in big part thanks to the role played by the church, especially the monks of Santa Cruz de Coimbra, in portraying the king as a hero, conquering the lands from the infidels in an attempt to support the reconquest and the crusades. So not only it ties into the tale about Portugal the beginnings of Portugal, but it also ties into this crusade spirit that we've been going on and on and on and on and about. And this battle is not done and dusted yet, because once again, there's a miracle in the mixture. The first mention we have of the miracle dates from 1416. So again, a much later, um, a much later reference than and not contemporary to the, to the battle. Uh, and this miracle, and this further portrays the king has a blessed and protected and this further portrays the king has blessed and protected by god sorry by god itself legitimizing the new country just quickly say once again that we're talking about a rebel king that needs everything in his power to legitimize and this is a very handy thing to have a miracle yeah I mean, we already had the Virgin Mary, and now we have God intervening directly with this king, with this Afonso Henriques, and making this country a thing. So basically, God is invested into Portugal being a thing. So what is the Pope going to say? No? Please. But wait, Inez, before, before we move on, you need to tell us what happened. How did God intervene? Apparently, the 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 tale goes that... A little bit before the battle starts, Afonso Henriques was visited by an old man. An old man that the king already knew from his dreams. And this man did him, made him a revelation. He said that he would win the battle. He would also say that in the next night, in the following night, in the following evening, for the king to leave the, the military camp alone, as soon as he would hear... As soon as he heard the sign from the place where the old man lived. And so did Afonso Henriques. It was then that a lightning ray illuminated everything around, uh, leaving only to be able to distinguish the sign of the cross and Jesus Christ crucified. Moved by this... Afonso Henriques kneeled down and he heard the voice of the Lord that 
promised him the victory in this and in battles to come. The next day, Don Alphonse Henrique won the battle. Right! Okay, so, you know, he won the battle and might have seen someone who he knew from his dreams who basically God wanted him to be king, okay? Let's not get lost in the details. It was also here that Afonso decided that uh, the Portuguese flag would from then on feature the five wounds of Christ. After the Battle of Arique, Dom Afonso Henrique decides to break an interior peace treaty and invades Galicia, taking many towns and castles in one go. When his cousin hears about this invasion, he then comes to stop him with a much larger army and starts invading Portuguese territory and Dom Alphonse Henrique comes to meet him and they meet at and they meet at the river Vich, which is where the battle will take place. Now in a bit of a surprising turn in now in a bit of a surprising turn of events, the Spanish and the Portuguese, rather than battling it out, decide that a tournament, a joust, will do. They do this to avoid like massive killings on both sides and they just decide to go to for a joust instead, like a proper medieval joust. And the, re and the result of this joust will stand as the battle's result. So it turns out that the luck was on the, size of the, was on the side of the Portuguese knights. So there you go, just a joust to decide the war. So after this joust, which the Portuguese win, the armistice becomes the Treaty of Zamora. So this now is one of the most important moments in the foundation of Portugal. The Treaty of Zamora, signed on the 5th of October of 1143, is where Afonso VII recognizes Dom Afonso Henrique as a king. Although it is implied that he owes him liege as Afonso VII holds the title of Emperor of all Hispania. So, Dom Afonso VII, he recognizes Dom Afonso Henrique as a king, but still a king under his power. In a bit of a trick, Dom Afonso Henrique makes an offer to the Pope, stating that he recognizes him as the only lord in this world. In that, he implies that he bends the knee only to the Pope and God, and not to his cousin. The Pope is happy to take the money, but he does not really acknowledge this pledge. Now, in the foundational episodes, there's another one that comes to mind and that we have to mention. There's the episode of the Cortes de Lamego, where our first king, Dom Alphonse Henrique, is meant to have been acclaimed by the people. Now, sadly, I mean, it's a beautiful tale and it sounds great and it looks great in history books, but sadly it never took place. So this was just a story made up by a very well-intentioned, um, a very well-intentioned writer named in his book written during the Spanish occupation. So basically he wrote this to inspire the Portuguese resistance during the Spanish occupation. Now. This was taken at face value until, in the, until Alexander Colano in the 19th century called it. So he realized that this had never take pla taken place and was nothing but a fantasy. Uh, actually, the first court's assembly only gathered in 1211 and this one would only have been composed of noblemen. And the second and the first assembly where plebeians would be represented didn't happen until 1254. So many years later and definitely Dom Alphonse Henrique was not acclaimed king in any of these. Now the last significant episode in the foundation of Portugal is in 1179 with the Bula Manifestis Probatum when, when the Pope finally accepts the kingdom of Portugal. So, even though, no, so, uh, the Kingdom of Portugal, so even though we did have the Treaty of Zamora, we did have all the battles has significant moments, it is only in 1179 that internationally the Kingdom of Portugal is fi finally recognized and Dom Afonso Henrique is recognized as the king of the country. <laughs> <laughs> We 
finished! We fucking finished! We done! <laughs> yes, we're finished! We're finished! We finally arrived in Portugal! We did! Our season is over! Our first season is finished! Yeah, so trials and tribulations and we arrived at the end of <laughs> the first season of Cork Out History. We survived in it! We survived! We did! We did! We done! A lot of editing to do, definitely. Okay, we hope you have enjoyed the ride and we hope it's not extremely confusing and we've made it a little bit easier and give you and given you some insight into our Portuguese history. And you know what? From here on we can only improve. <laughs> <laughs> it can only get better. <laughs> yes. Stick with us. Give us another chance. Don't leave us. <laughs> yeah. We'll be around with a completely different season, in a completely different time, in, and in a completely different format. We won't spoil you, you have to stick around and find out. See you in the next episode! <laughs> Bye! Bye! <laughs> the first season of Cork Out History is finished. Pa -pa -da 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 -da